Hello, welcome to our webinar on costing methods. Hey, everybody. Hey, good morning. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. Hello, hello. Um, I, thank you, everybody, for joining. I see a whole bunch of people coming in right now kind of thing. Uh, my name is Philip. You may have seen me in some other webinars and things like that or, or support material around the the thing. Yeah, I'm on the support team, and uh, it's great to see you all here. Ileano, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm actually in Europe, so for me, it would be good afternoon. Uh, I've been in the company for just right before uh, COVID, so before everything changed. It's been three years and a half, more or less. And yeah, you can find me in the support team, in the CSI team. Um, and I'm a CSM, a Customer Success Manager, so I for sure talked with a few of you already. So have a nice webinar. And hi, everybody. I'm Cassandra. I'm going to be hosting today. Um, I got my start at Inflow and Support. I think I'm coming up on my ninth year here at Archon. Um, I'm no longer on support, so I'm a little rusty. So Phil will help me out <laughs> and Ileano with some questions. But uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. So we'll be talking about costing methods. And to get started, we'll, we'll talk about First of all, costs in general and different product types, how they're affected by your costing method. Um, which costing methods are available to you in Inflow? So moving average, FIFO or FIFO, however you like to say it, LIFO or LIFO, and manual. And then we'll be talking about how they work in Inflow. So first, let's just talk a little bit about costs before we get into costing methods. So it's the cost involved with buying your products and getting them to you. So in Inflow, that's the price you pay your vendor per item. It's also, if you pay for shipping, that'll get factored into your cost. Um, if you have to pay any kind of other costs that you don't pay to your vendor, so it might be a customs or a landing fee or something like that, um, that can get factored into your cost as well. Um, and then if you happen to buy in a different currency, that could also get factored into your cost and inflow. Um, if you don't, then it's not applicable to you. But if you buy from overseas, then that might be something that factors in. OK, so what does cost impact or why should we care about cost? So it's going to impact your inventory value in inflow. So in inflow, your total cost value of your inventory is made up of how many you have and what was the average cost of, of that item across all your different items that you have in inventory. And so somewhere you might see that, for example, is on the inventory details report. You would see your quantity, your average cost for that item, and then it multiplies that out and adds them all up so that you see your total inventory value. So cost is going to affect that. Um, cost will also impact your cost of goods sold and your profit. So you might see that on a report like your sales by product details report. So you'll see how much you sold an item for, what the cost of that item was, and then therefore what the profit is based on that. Another thing cost can impact is markup. So Inflow has a feature where you can actually set your prices to be relative to your cost. So that's called fixed markup in Inflow. So on the web app, it's an advanced feature. You'd have to turn on that little toggle there you see in the picture. And you can set your price to be relative to your cost. So for my retail price here, I have a fixed markup of 200%. So based on my cost of 59, 200% of that, it's giving me $177 as my sales price. Uh, or you could maybe have something that's like at cost. Maybe you let an employee have something at cost, or maybe you just need to track um, your cost of inventory going out, but you're not actually selling it. If you have a situation like that, you might want to have 0% markup. In that case, your price is just going to be equal to your cost if it's a 0%. So markup is another thing that's going to be affected by your cost. And so uh, that, just yeah. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt there. Yeah, just just good to keep in mind too with the with all those markups and stuff like that. That's like per product and per pricing scheme and stuff too. So you can have it set differently for all your different products. Um, I believe it defaults to um, a, a regular price, but you can change that on any of your products to the to the fixed markup if that's something you want. So right, yes, yeah, so you could add multiple uh, pricing schemes and have them 
apply to different customers or different sales orders. Okay, so we're going to get into for this webinar as we talk about costing methods. These are pretty much all applying just to stocked products. So in Inflow, you can have different types of products. You can have stocked products, which is when you want to keep track of how many you have of each. You can have serialized products, which are um, each product, each individual item will have a serial number. So for example, you're probably joining this webinar on a phone or a laptop or a PC. All of those devices would have a unique serial number that identifies it as different. Even though if you have two iPhones beside each other, they would each have their own unique um, serial number to identify them. Um, we have non-stocked products, which are products you don't want to keep track of how many you have. So for example, if you just want to order uh, like a ton of packing paper or bubble wrap or something like that, and you don't need to actually keep track of how much you have, you could use a non-stock product for that. And then service items are usually um, some kind of labor that's being done to something. It might be painting it or like welding or something like that that's not actually physically in stock. Um, and so as we talk about costing methods, um, service and non-stocked items, they're always going to use manual costs, even if you've used something else system-wide. So that's why we're talking about those different product types in Inflow. And for serial numbers, they work a little differently as well. So they'll actually have each serial number will have its own cost layer and you'll actually be able to trace back to the particular number. So that's why we're not going to spend too much time talking about serial products for this. And then before we get too into it, a quick word about how to get to all of this cost stuff across the Inflow apps. Um, so on all the apps, web, mobile, and Windows, you can create purchase orders that will bring in new costs. Again, depending on your costing method, we'll get more into that. Um, you can see the cost field on the product record across all those apps. But if you need to change your costing method, that's going to need to be done from the web app, which is app.infloinventory.com. And then in Windows, currently, it's only possible to view and edit your cost layers in the Windows app. So they'll probably change in the future. But for now, if you need to look at your historical cost layers, that's going to have to be uh, Windows. So now we will get into the different costing method options you have and how they work. So first of all, we have moving average. Um, you might know it as weighted average. That's something else that it goes by. And basically what it does is it calculates an average of old costs and new costs. So we're going to run through an example here. So let's say on October 1st, we buy 10 sunglasses. And let's say that they cost $2 each. And we sell some of them. So now we're down to three. And we bought them at $2 each. So that, that's our cost. And then let's say, Bill. Several days later. <laughs> now it's October 15th. Thank you. <laughs> we buy 10 more sunglasses. And let's say inflation has hit. They are now $3. Um, but we still have those, those old ones left as well. We have three left at $2. So the way that moving average handles the situation where we have some new ones coming in at a different cost than our current inventory is it's going to multiply the three left at $2 and it's going to add the 10 coming in at $3 and divide by 13. So what we end up with with this scenario is an average cost of $2.77. So you can see $2.77 is closer to $3 than it is to $2. So it's going to do a weighted average of however many, you, if you have a lot coming in at the new cost, that's going to be more heavily weighed to what's left. But if you have a lot left over in inventory and only a few coming in, what's left in inventory is going to weigh more heavily. So that's, that's why the weighted average. And then we'll, we'll run through that same scenario again, but this time with FIFO, first in, first out. So the way this one works is it's going to use up the oldest cost layers first. So we have the same scenario where you're buying those 10 and they were $2 and we're selling some. So we have some left over at $2, three of them, and then fill. <laughs> Several days later. Thank you. 
Um, it's now October 15th. We have 10 sunglasses we're buying. And again, inflation has struck. They're $3 now. Um, but we still have our old ones. So in this case with FIFA, what we'll do is we'll use up the oldest layer first. So we're going to sell all of the $2 ones first. And this doesn't necessarily mean like we're separating them in the warehouse in piles of which ones were two and which ones were three. It just means that we're going to, from an accounting perspective, we're going to count our cost as $2 for these ones that we sell. So if our price stays, let's say $5, um, on the $2 ones, we would make a $3 profit. And on the $3 ones, if we don't change our price, we would make a $2 uh, profit. So just to know how your profit will look in a FIFO situation. So we'd use up oldest to newest. And then we'll go through this. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt. Just uh, we, we had a great question from April in the chat, um, just uh, back on the moving average before we move on to, to LIFO. Um, she had said, what happens to the cost once those three are sold? Um, so I think like if you had sold everything. So the cost kind of keeps rolling up. So with with moving average, the cost is constantly adjusted as you um, buy new ones. So if we were left, if we had zero left, and then we bought the 10 uh, new ones, we would have the cost of the 10 new ones coming in. So the $3 would be our cost. Does awesome. that answer that? Yeah, no, 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 that's, that, that's fantastic. Yeah, so basically with, with the moving average, if you go to zero, then whatever your new one is, um, that'll kind of take over. Otherwise, as you said, yeah, it's doing those calculations based off of the, the existing and the, the new stuff that you're getting in. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, and then we'll just go through one last scenario here with uh, LIFO. So same thing again, $2, we bought 10, sold some, they were $2. <laughs> Make you do it every time. Several days <laughs> later. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so we've bought 10 more. They're now $3. And we have these ones left over. So with LIFO, it's, we're going to use the newest ones first. So we won't touch the old ones until we've used up all the newest uh, layers first. So We'll actually sell the $3 ones first, and then we'll sell the $2 ones. But if we happen to just keep buying more under a LIFO situation, what we would do is we would just keep using the newest ones. So we won't touch the older layers. So this time we have the 350 ones we would use first, and then the $3 and then the $2 based on the, the dates. So we're using the newest layer and saving the oldest layer for last. So we'd only get to those $2 ones under a LIFO if we stop buying and we run out to only those three. Otherwise, we'll always just keep using the, the latest uh, cost for LIFO. And then we have manual. So manual is a bit different. So with manual, if you buy on a purchase order at $2, um, and again, you sell at $2, what will happen, Phil, won't make you do it this time. <laughs> what will happen with manual is you have to actually either manually calculate or you have to overwrite the cost. So even though under a manual situation, we have some old ones left at $2 and we have new ones coming in at three. If we put three in our cost field on the product record, which is what you'd have to do with manual, um, you're just overwriting the fact that you did have some left at $2. So you could either calculate it outside of inflow and fill that in or if you overwrite it with three dollars it's it's a bit inaccurate because it's kind of forgetting about those two dollar ones that you have so just something to note about manual cool you want to um sorry we questions? got we got yeah. a couple yeah. of questions here yet yeah. so um got a, a good one here from evangelos sorry if i mispronounce it um but he's saying when we deal with products that have a long bill of materials when using moving average does it always calculate a moving average for all of the bill of material components it does yes so with um if when you're buying the components on a purchase order, it basically works the same way as a finished of buying something to sell. Um, so your component items will use the moving average of what you purchased those components. And it's, it's at the very time that you're actually using them on a work order or manufacturing order, as we call it now, um, that 
whatever the cost is at that time, when you actually pull those components for the finished product, it'll use that cost, that moving average cost. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then he did have a follow-up saying, also, if the product is bought in a different currency, does it use the exchange rate we put on the PO to calculate the dollar value cost? It does, yes, yes. So it's great that if you have it on the PO, that's perfect. It's gonna use that rate to do the calculation back to your home currency. Cool. Um, April also had another one saying, um, where is the calculation shown for accounting purposes? Um, <laughs> So it doesn't, do you want to take it, Phil? Sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, so it doesn't show it um, directly, like kind of anywhere in the, the UI or anything like that of it. Um, we do have a report that you can run that would actually show you kind of the whole breakdown of um, how Inflow comes to that. Uh, let me just pull up which report it is. It is... Uh the product cost report. So in the Windows app, that's under inventory reports. Um, in the web app, it may be slightly organized differently, but um, yeah, but the product cost report, when you pull that up, it will actually show every single transaction for each different product that has changed the cost um, over the course of history, essentially, so that you can see like on uh, PO1, let's just say, uh, this many came in at this cost. So the cost change was $100 or whatever on sales order or something, we sold this many, so you now have this much in cost and it'll break down every single one that way. So that's the product cost report um, is the, the best way that you would be able to track all that. Cool. Okay, I'll, I'll start and then just feel free to interrupt me, Phil, when you wanna go to the next one. Cool. Um, so we're gonna just talk a little bit about how the costs, what the costs are made up of. I touched on it earlier, but we have a purchase order here. This is going to apply to moving average, FIFO and LIFO uh, costing. So all of those. Um, so first of all, the price that you're paying your vendor for the individual item is going to factor into the cost in Inflow. Also, um, one I didn't mention earlier is if you have a service type item on your purchase order, the cost of that service gets factored into the stocked item. So for example, in this case here, I am um, purchasing some sunglasses with my branding on them and I'm paying my vendor to package them up into a nice box that has like my brand and a sticker and maybe some tissue paper or something. So um, I'm paying for a co-packing service for each of my sunglasses. So I'm paying 20 cents for that. That's gonna get factored into the cost of my branded sunglasses in this example. Um, also, there is a freight cost on this purchase order. So that's gonna get factored into the the cost of my sunglasses. Um, I also have filled out non-vendor costs here. So that could be landing dude, like landing fee or customs or something. Um, and essentially anything that you know you have to pay to get this product that you're not paying to your vendor directly, but it is costing you to get this item. You can put that in the uh, non-vendor costs. And then the, the currency exchange rate as well. So in this case, I have my uh, home currency as Canadian, but this vendor is American, so I'm, I have uh, the Canadian to US. So that's gonna also affect my cost because Inflow is gonna convert this purchase order back into Canadian dollars on my product uh, record. Did you want to jump in with any questions here, Phil, or are we? Sure. Yeah. So, so just kind of following up on April's question, because she was saying the product cost report doesn't show the original value in another currency um, and that the accountants would want to see a purchase history report with the product cost to see the different valuations. Um, yeah. So the, you're hundred percent correct with that. Um, unfortunately, inflow, the way we do everything, it converts everything to your home currency. So we don't, um, I guess, display in those other foreign currencies, because you could have, um, again, coming from multiple different currencies or anything like that, which is why it's doing all those calculations. So uh, that's why we're kind of storing it all just in your home currency. Um, I think PO reports would still be in the currency you purchased in though, right? Yeah. Um, so and, kinda... Sorry. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I think that the PO it like reports on the PO would be in the currency you purchase, but then your cost reports would be in your home currency. So you kind of have to probably yeah. do a little bit of manipulation to figure out from there. 
Yeah, if you also take a look at some of the reports, um, I'm not sure the ones off the top of my head because a whole bunch of them have it, but a lot of them in the columns when you're selecting them, you can select um, both currency, um, like it'll just say currency or currency foreign um, or total foreign or whatever, and that would then be reflecting the the um, the different Original currencies currency. value. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so we had another question when giving a customer a discount on an SO, why does that reflect onto the price of the whole product? Um, which I guess may not be cost related. Giving a customer a discount on an SO, why does that reflect onto the price of the whole product? Um, um, maybe if it might be that they click the save back. If you click the like if you edited the price on a sales order and click the save back button, that would affect your product price. But if you just give like a percentage discount, that shouldn't affect the product price. The other thing, it'll have a little arrow beside the price. Um, and if you click that arrow, it does save back to the product record. Whereas if you don't click that, that the change would just apply to that sales order that you're doing for that particular customer. It might be that. Yeah, it sounds like it might be something like that. And um, if not, if you, if you have more questions or need follow up on anything, you can always reach out to us support at inflowinventory.com. We, we'd love to help and we can go kind of more in depth on some of these questions and things like that too. Um, another question we did have here was how are anticipated builds calculated and is there a way to turn it off? Um, so that's to do with like our new um, manufacturing update that uh, that just went out. Um, essentially, the anticipated builds are calculated based off of your finished products. So you've got your finished products and components, um, any sales orders or work orders with your finished product on it. Um, Inflow is calculating back how many component pieces are needed to build and then sell those, um, which is so it's kind of trickling down. So if you have sub assemblies or anything like that, that will trickle down through all of that. Um, at the moment, there is not a way to turn it off. Uh, that is, um, I guess, just kind of like a part of the, the new update with it and was how it was always supposed to have worked. Um, I just don't think it was kind of quite going down as minutely as it does now. Um, but it's definitely uh, something that we we like taking the feedback for and everything like that. So if uh, if you want to send us an email at support at info um, support at infoinventory.com, sorry, we can record that feedback and pass it along to to the higher ups and stuff, and they they look over all that for every time they're kind of planning like updates and changes and things like that. So so we definitely really appreciate all that feedback. I'll just answer a couple too I see here. So Tony sure. asks, how do I access that screen? A bit about costs. So this is actually just a snippet of a purchase order. And I just sort of labeled um, the parts of the purchase order that will affect your costs. And somebody asked, is there an option to set margin rather than markup and a minimum margin warning if costs rise? Fortunately, no, Inflow only has the, the markup option, it doesn't have a margin option. Um, if you do set a fixed markup, that will ensure that your price is always greater than your cost. So as your cost changes um, with fixed markup, your price will, will rise as your cost rises or fall if your cost happens to fall if it does go that way. Um, freight should be on both. Uh, Donald asked about freight being on web version only. Um, it's on both the Windows app and the web app. With um, the Windows app, though, it may be hidden unless you actually click um, the shipping, like the toggle ship or add little, shipping button. Yeah, it's it's like it doesn't look like a button. It's underlined. I think it says add text, shipping. Text, yeah, add shipping. Yeah, it's just text. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I'll keep moving, but feel free to jump jump in with more uh, questions, Phil. Cool. Um, and I just did want to also give a quick note on uh, finished products, so it will be. Um, it's similar to a, to buying something, except for instead, it's now going to be made up of your component cost as well as any operations costs that you have. So this is relatively new um, in Inflow that now instead of um, previously, people may have added like labor as a service item on the bill of materials. Now you can actually add that as an assembly um, cost, an operation cost. So if you have to go through different procedures and they have different costs, 
you can add various operations to a bill of materials now, and that will get reflected in the finished product cost or the subassembly cost if it's a um, subassembly. So we're going to talk a bit about getting your initial costs into Inflow if you're just getting started. Um, so ideally, you would set up your costing method from the beginning before you have stock levels in. But we know we might be talking to some users where that hasn't been the case and you need to fix things. That's OK. Um, but the ideal case is if you're getting started to pick your costing method before putting any stock levels into Inflow. Um, with moving average or manual, you can do a product details import that includes uh, product costs and then do a stock levels import. Um, so just how this looks in the uh, web app, just note that the cost field is, is always unmapped by default and you have to choose to actually map the cost. So you would just click the drop down and select cost. And this is because we don't want you to accidentally um, overwrite your costs. So it does take an intentional mapping, whereas everything else, if you have the inflow headers, will auto map for you when you do an import. Cost won't. We want to make sure you, you meant to update the cost. So just be aware of that. Um, and then in terms of getting your costs in, if you're starting with FIFO or LIFO, you want to do a cost. Um, for those methods, it can only be updated through purchase orders. So what you can do if you're doing a bulk uh, getting started is you can import purchase orders. So instead of importing product details like we would with moving average, you can import uh, purchase orders to bring in the cost and the stock levels. So whatever your costs are um, and then how many you have. Um, if you're getting started and you don't want to go back and figure out like what vendor, what order number. Um, you can always do sort of a fake uh, import to get your initial starting levels in where you just have the um, vendor name and the order number as initial or starting stock or something like that. Um, just something to note with that is that the order date and would have to be the same for all of them if you are doing it that way. Um, and this, we have how to do this in our uh, learning center. So this is just a screenshot from there. So if, if you're looking to do that, there's an article there that will walk you through exactly how to do that. You want to jump in, Phil? Um, or, yeah, no, sorry, sorry. No, um, I'll <laughs> toss the, the article in the chat uh, so people can definitely take a look at that. Um, a April did have another question where she was just asking if there was a new general ledger report that helps separate the costs, like uh, the, um, the Operation costs, sorry, so, so many new terms and get stuck right. in my brain, um, which at the moment we don't have a, a new report that will show that. I do know they're, they're planning on, um, I guess, taking the feedback uh, from the community and everything and seeing what kinds of reports or anything would be needed about some of the new changes. So um, I'll definitely uh, record that and pass it back to, to let them know. Cool. Thanks, Phil. Um, okay, so we're going to get into moving average, just some details about each of the costing methods now. So moving average is the inflow recommended method if you're not already using another method for accounting purposes. So definitely always defer to your finance people or your accounting people about what costing method you should use. Um, but otherwise, if, if no other preference, we do recommend uh, moving average. And the reason for that is that it is basically accuracy combined with flexibility. So um, it's still really accurate, but it's a lot easier to use. It's a little less strict and stringent than uh, FIFO and LIFO is to use with Inflow. Um, so with moving average, your costs adjust automatically based on your purchase order prices, what you pay your vendor, along with those other factors that we mentioned earlier. Um, you can import to update your costs at any point in time. So if, if anything changes or if you realize like, shoot, my costs weren't in there properly, it's really easy to fix mistakes and update things with moving average. You can do historic adjustments too. So if you happen to run a sales order, like if you're running a profit report and you see like, oh, I don't have any profit or I have all profit, um, you, your cost was probably wrong and you can go back and you can fix that really easily with inflow. And this is how the, the moving average cost history looks. So you can actually see at certain points in time what the cost was and how it changed. And then the remarks uh, column shows you like which transaction 
caused that to happen? Was it a sales or was it a purchase or was it an adjustment? Um, and you can go in and create an adjustment too. So you can actually say, actually back in 2021, um, January, it should have been this cost and you can put that in there. And then that kind of flows through to your report. So if you go back and run your report again, you should have the right profit, for example, in, in our previous example. So this is how it actually looks to adjust your cost. And these screenshots are from Windows because this is only possible to do in the Windows app. Go ahead, Phil. I feel like you had something. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Cool. So then we'll go into manual costing method. So for manual, it does require you to type or import all your costs. So you have full control, but you also have to make sure that you are constantly updating it if you want it to be uh, correct. Anytime you do a purchase order in Inflow, if you have manual costing on, your purchase orders will increase your stock, but they won't update your costs if you have manual turned on. You can always import costs or manually adjust things with manual, makes sense. And you can do historic cost adjustments with manual as well. Um, it basically shows you what your costs have been in the past and you can edit as well. Um, so one huge caveat to note with manual costing method is if you're coming from, let's say, moving average and switching into manual, by switching, it will reset all your costs to zero because Moving average was using your purchase order costs. When you switch to manual, it's no longer using those. So they're gonna all be zero. If you do wanna switch to manual and avoid this, what you can do is before switching, you can export your product details while you're still in moving average, for example, and then switch to manual, everything will be zero. And then you can import in uh, your costs. And if you're doing that with, um, that would apply to any of the costing methods. Just do a product details export, and then you'll be able to import into manual. Manual is the only one that's going to reset them to zero. Um, so just something to know there. Cool. Um, um, yeah, ahead. sorry, I'll jump jump in. There were two quick things. Um, April had said does, um, this is when you were looking at the uh, cost history in the Windows app there. Um, she was saying, does the cost remain the same then over the years? So say the cost in 2020 remains the same cost if I run a report about 2020 in 2024. Um, so it which... should, unless you do any kind of um, like past adjustments like this, like unless you actually or if you happen to backdate something otherwise it shouldn't it shouldn't change like historically it shouldn't change unless you specifically backdate or make a historic adjustment yeah perfect exactly so um yeah so so when you do run those reports in the future it should be the same <laughs> um and then uh, i saw evangelos also had a question if you choose to use the web app or the desktop app which would you suggest will be best looking at the future uh they're planning to move everybody to the web app now that manufacturing orders are there um so kind of the the mythos and the way that we're kind of um, planning things is that, that the web app should be the future going forward so that is probably the best one to to continue using um for the first future at least for now the windows app will still exist um, but again that is only available on windows which is why we're trying to get all the features from it or as most as many of them as we can to the web app um, because then anyone on mac linux uh, windows uh, you don't have to deal with installing things and windows updates and lots of other issues that that the windows app unfortunately um, does fall prey to so uh, for the time being unfortunately there will be a few minor differences uh, between the two systems, but all of the new features, essentially, the main big new things are all going to the web app, and the, the Windows app may, over time, kind of slowly fall fall behind. So, um, so yeah, so again, like with uh, manufacturing orders and stuff, the operations are only available in the web app, not in the Windows app. So um, moving over to that would probably be best. Yeah, and uh, Matt had a question about what is the web app. So every time we talk about the web app, we're just talking about in your browser going to app.inflowinventory.com. Yeah. Um, and then Tony had asked, what is the difference between cost and the bill of materials total cost? Um, so I think this is a case where when you're when you're manufacturing, the bill of materials total cost will show kind of like the predicted cost at that moment when you're looking at it but it could be that in the meantime you get in some more 
components and the cost goes up because you know, maybe the cost your vendor is charging you has gone up. So the actual cost at the time that you actually do the manufacturing order or work order, you might know it as, um, that's your going to be your cost. It may differ from the bill of materials uh, total cost just if something has changed in the time between those passing. If that makes sense. Um, okay. I'm going to keep going, but jump in uh, if we need to, Phil. Sure. So um, just a bit about LIFO or LIFO. Um, just to note that it is specific to where you are. So most places actually don't allow uh, LIFO as, so for example, under international financial reporting standards, it's not allowed, um, but it is allowed under GAAP, which is in the, the United States. So just be aware if you're not in the United States that it might it might not be an option for you. And then for both FIFO and LIFO, they, they're gonna use purchase orders to update the costs. Um, you're not able to manually adjust the cost. It's locked, it's either like grayed out or it has a little lock icon. So in the web app, it looks like that. It's got the little lock on it, you can't type in there. You can view historic cost layers, but you can't adjust them without a purchase order. So um, if your costs are wrong, you'd have to go back and find that purchase order that updated them, or you'd have to go back and create a purchase order to update an old uh, cost layer. And this is how they look with uh, FIFO LIFO. So it'll have the date and the how many and what the cost was at the that layer. Um, if you increase through a stock adjustment, it'll use the last cost. So I just did that as a test. Um, and so uh, go ahead. sorry, actually, just, just yeah. speaking on that, what one thing that we see in support a lot of times is, um, it, it, <laughs> excuse me, especially with FIFO and LIFO, if you adjust your stock in um, without doing a PO before, it's going to adjust that stock in with a $0 cost. And, and that's why it's staying at $0 or anything like that. So um, just like she said, when you do use a stock adjustment, it will use the last cost. So um, you always want to make sure that there is like an existing cost first if you're going to use a stock adjustment. But typically, we recommend purchase orders for like for bringing stock in for FIFO LIFO. Yep. Um, and then just another note when you're switching from another costing method into FIFO or LIFO, um, it's not going to reset your costs to zero the way manual will, but it's only going to calculate the costs. It's going to do a recalculation and those that recalculation is just going to be based on purchase orders. So if you started using moving average and you imported costs to get started, it's not going to count those costs. It's only going to count what costs were on your purchase orders. So it, it'll recalculate, it will change your costs. So just something to know there. Um, and we do have some recommended steps if you're moving to FIFO or LIFO in, in the Learning Center um, for how to kind of handle that. For sure. Um, and so, yeah, so th there were a few uh, comments in there saying that uh, my bill of materials cost has a dollar amount, but then it doesn't reflect on the cost of the actual product page. And so that that is by design. So when you look at your bill of materials page, that's kind of like an estimated total cost for what it would um, cost to build that product if that bill of materials stays exact same. And that's kind of like a snapshot of what the cost of all those items are at that time. When you make a manufacturer order and complete it, those costs could have changed. So we won't automatically put that cost right away in the product if you have zero stock of it. We will only update that cost once you actually do manufacture it. Because um, again, you, you might even add extra components or subtract them or something like that. So we don't want to give like an inaccurate um, cost and so on that bill of materials page is kind of like an estimate um, to make it a little easier to know how much it should cost. Cool. Thanks. Um, and now if you need help with costs, um, you know, we didn't cover everything. We tried to cover high level. Um, but for example, if your costs aren't working properly, you need help troubleshooting, then the Inflow support team is there to help you with that. If you need help on how to get started or how to get set up with costing, your Inflow customer success manager can help with that. Or if you have a new team member that you've hired and they need some training on Inflow and how this works, again, your customer success manager can help you out with that. 
And that's all we had today on costing methods. Yeah, and I think otherwise, I, I think you, I think you were so thorough, Cassan, that, oh. uh, that you got you got everyone's <laughs> questions pretty much answered already. That this, I was super excited to to help with this one actually because we get so many questions that support for it. So so you really did a, a great job going over all that. All right, so thanks everybody for joining. We'll end it there. And if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to support at inflowinventory.com and we can go more in depth with you on your particulars. Sure, so take yeah. care. Thank have you, everybody. Day. Bye.